pulmonologist who trained in Alberta and has uh, considerable experience with the limb preservation clinic in Edmonton. And um, I'm looking forward to talking about the pathology of diabetes and specifically the diabetic type. Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Robin. I think you've set the stage actually perfectly for, uh, for my talk on uh, pathogenesis and pathophysiology of diabetes and diabetic foot disease. And as you can see from what Robin presented, we've changed our approach completely uh, from treating diabetes from a glucocentric method to more of a comprehensive approach, taking into account that complex hormonal, metabolic, and vascular disease uh, and it, we've seen some radical changes. So start off with, uh, I don't, these are my disclosures, um, but nothing really to mitigate as it relates to this talk. And we're gonna dive right in. So I'm gonna cover the pathogenesis of diabetes. I'd like to highlight the distinction between type one diabetes and type two diabetes, and then we'll cover the pathogenesis of diabetic foot disease. I'm using it just as a very general <laughs> term, uh, but we're really gonna focus on the two bases of pathogenesis peripheral neuropathy and peripheral arterial disease or vascular disease. And what I really want to try to do, because pathogenesis sometimes is a really dry topic, is try to make those links and how can we learn from how the robust preclinical studies in type 2 diabetes, specifically and type 1, have really changed the game for how we treat diabetes. And perhaps using that as a model as we think of diabetic foot disease and how can we ensure, number one, that we have robust, sufficient data in the preclinical field of research? And then how can we properly translate that and then obviously do the proper studies to, to try to get outcomes? And how can we be receptive to those changes so that we're, we're really dynamic and timely as we manage diabetic foot complications? Why is it important to understand pathogenesis uh, of diabetes, number one? Uh, and then diabetic foot disease. But you can see that diabetes uh, or diabetic foot disease is within that bigger framework of diabetes, the systemic disease, and really developing a target intervention for prevention or management just for diabetic foot disease is missing the big picture. So we need to take that together and perhaps we can find some common pathways and perhaps one intervention that's already used for diabetes, we can also evaluate outcomes for diabetic foot disease. So really the objective of understanding pathogenesis is to allow development of targeted interventions to cure the diabetes. And I think you've seen Diabetes Canada has changed its logo, just like uh, and, uh, uh, MD Anderson, the, the cancer uh, uh, center in Texas. So we're aiming for cure, but if we can't, then we do still want to try to prevent or alter disease course. And so we'll start with the poll question. So, in type 2 diabetes, type glycemic control reduces the risk of developing peripheral neuropathy compared to conventional glycemic control. So true or false? I'll give you the stats here. So we have, I mean, we have about 86% saying it's true and 15% saying it's false. And so I guess I have something to add here. Uh, so the answer is false, but the, if we change the statement for type 1 diabetes, the statement is true. And so I'm going to put this question forward to the audience and just feel free to kind of shout out your answer, share your comments. Why is it that glycemic control did not show a reduction in peripheral neuropathy and diabetic foot disease alone? Time of diagnosis. Time of diagnosis, yeah. So maybe we're catching them late and we missed the boat. So among diabetes, type 1 diabetes occupies 10% uh, of diabetes. And the core defects, um, which patients sometimes don't even fully understand, that, so there are distinct differences. The core defects in type 1 diabetes, uh, we see progressive beta cell destruction. So at the time of diagnosis, about 90% of the beta cells are gone. And that results in insulin deficiency. And the big difference in pathogenesis is that this destruction is primarily mediated through an autoimmune destructive process in a genetically susceptible individual, typically with one or two environmental hits. And there's still ongoing research, some hypotheses about viruses that might be involved. So stay tuned, we might see some big changes as well in type 1 diabetes. Looking at type 2 diabetes, we also see beta cell destruction and dysfunction, but through different mechanisms. So we have a bigger component of genetic component over there, but also environmental and behavioral um, etiologies as well there. 
But then the key feature also is insulin resistance. And if you just kind of cover up the adipocytes over there, uh, it was thought that the triad in the 80s is basically, you know, hyperglycemia explains everything, and everything was targeted to that. Well, we realized that we didn't really have the full picture, and it's great that there was lots of investment in the preclinical study data. So whoever knows Ralph DiFranzo, I think he's, he's radically changed how we approach type 2 diabetes. So this is his ominous octet that he presented in 2008 at the ADA. Uh, and uh, you can see that in addition to the three components, the insulin resistance at the liver, um, at the muscle, and as well as the beta cell destruction, we see the pathogenesis and the core defects extend to various other organs. So if you think back about Robin's talk, you can see why you know, we have different modalities to tackle it from a pathophysiological point of view. And I think we need to look at that when we look at diabetic foot disease as well. So we also have the interest in fact, so the gut, which is a big hormonal organ, um, and that's where GLP-1 analogs come in. But we also know that nerves also express GLP-1, and there are some preclinical studies to look at that. Uh, so just put it in context where we have some shared pathway between the two. Uh, and then we have the insulin resistance at the level of the adipocytes, so they're not these innocent fat cells we now know. Uh, and then there's also increased glucose reabsorption, where you see Robin mentioned the SGLT2 inhibitors that basically um, reduce the threshold of glucose by which the kidneys excrete it. And of course, when that came out in the endocrinology group, we were like, oh, that's crazy. We're going to make people pee sugar. But really, it touches on a, on a robust part and a core defect. And we see as well vascular, cardiovascular benefits with that. And with the GLP-1 analogs, they also stabilize plaques. Uh, the atherosclerotic plaques, and they do have an anti-inflammatory component. So, you know, just the thought that perhaps with proper studies, maybe there's a role for that in diabetic foot disease as well. And there's neurotransmitter dysfunction and uh, IL alpha cells as well. So, going back to the poll question, perhaps the part that was missing was the metabolic syndrome um, with the epidemic of obesity and the biological changes that happen with that. So I'm not going to be putting details on pathways. It's actually a bit intimidating having clinician scientists and vascular surgeons. So when I get to that section, I'm just going to basically highlight some insights and some general points just to get us thinking about when we are doing research or when we're looking at implementation to make sure that we have the preclinical data there, the translation, so that we can have we can set ourselves up for success when we're looking at outcomes. But we know that there's fatty deposition in the nerves. The nerves also express LDL, and so in the abundance of oxidized LDL, that triggers an inflammatory process, production of uh, radicals and uh, oxidative stress, which plays a role, um, and then also mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress, um, and this kind of collectively results in a cascade of metabolic inflammation. So the pathways are important because they do present some potential markers that could be targets for future studies. Um, and that's where the, the implication of understanding this comes in. So peripheral neuropathy, just in general, it's an interplay between different factors. So we have the metabolic components, uh, we have the vascular component uh, as well that plays a role over there, and one of, each one individually doesn't fully explain the pathogenesis. But then there's some data that shows that perhaps some hormonal aspects as well play a role. So in the state of insulin deficiency, uh, we know that insulin plays a role in nerve repair and as well as insulin-like growth factors. So IGF-1 as well plays a role. Uh, we know that those are impaired uh, with diabetes. Ultimately, the interplay of all these results in an imbalance in nerve damage and nerve repair, favoring nerve damage, and that's where we see the clinical manifestation. Uh, so we see progressive loss of sensation and structural nerve damage over there. Charcot neuropathy, another subtype, so we also need to be cautious about not generalizing those pathogenesis on all of neuropathy. I think we all know it's quite heterogeneous over there. So some great advancements were done in Charcot neuropathy. Previous theories in the past, probably a combination of neurotraumatic and neurovascular components, but recent highlight on the radical OPG or osteoprotegrin pathways. So Rankle basically is a member of the super TNF family and, path, and, and, and it basically induces and stimulates osteoclasts which eat away from bones. And in our system we always have the antagonist system, so that's where the osteoprotegrin comes in. And there is an imbalance, specifically in Charcot, 
uh, Charcot foot neuropathy, and that's where we've seen the emerging um, concept of using bisphosphonates and other treatments to try to specifically target that. And recent studies also show some genetic variations in this particular pathway. So, you know, sharp neuropathy, we know the big morbidity, mortality with that, but that's another avenue where, you know, investing in the preclinical studies, properly translating it, can really help our patients. Um, and so just for us to, to strive to make sure that that component is something we're looking at. So, vascular disease. So I'm going to start with vascular disease in general, and then we'll talk about peripheral arterial disease. Uh, Richard Neville very nicely debunked the myth about uh, the microcirculation uh, being impacted, and you know perhaps there's no role for revascularization. So we know that's not the case. Uh, but I'll just highlight a few um, a few aspects in the pathogenesis uh, that need to be considered. Uh, so endothelial dysfunction and inflammation, um, and reactive oxygen species. Uh, generating pathways that's upregulated uh, with vascular disease and diabetes. Uh, there's impairment of vascular repair capacities and uh, hyperglycemia dependent microRNA deregulation is another pathway that's involved. Uh, and then we have the thrombotic state or the prothrombotic state that's part of the vascular uh, disease of diabetes. And we see alterations of coagulation, platelet reactivity, and microparticle release. And then there's also the role of epigenetic-driven transcription, and we see basically all that collectively is contributing to this pro-inflammatory, pro-thrombotic state. And another concept that's also been noticed is that, or the concept of vascular hyperglycemic memory. Now we see that in diabetes, we call it the legacy effect, but it looks like, you know, just like you highlighted, that perhaps we're catching the boat, we're, we're, we're intervening quite late, and we need to perhaps look at those interventions pre-diabetes. So we know in type 2 diabetes, our tools are not great, and once they've been diagnosed, they have about 80% dysfunction of their beta cells. They've probably had this process going on for about 10 years or more. So just a thought as we plan interventions to take that into account. Looking at peripheral arterial disease, um, so we have the atherosclerosis uh, component that plays a role, um, and we have a mismatch in supply and demand, which results in hypoxia. Compensatory mechanisms kick in uh, through arter arteriogenesis and angiogenesis, uh, but then we have a high metabolic demand uh, that's not met because of the atherosclerosis and hypoxia, and that results in a cascade of inflammatory, um, inflammatory pathways being uh, being activated, but also endothelial dysfunction um, and production of radicals there. Um, I won't kind of stay long over here, but there are also studies looking at biomarkers that perhaps we can better identify people with peripheral arterial disease so that we can actually know who to target and so that we can monitor progression. Uh, some of those are promising, but we still need some more studies to, to speak about the clinical use. So, Hopefully with kind of that very quick overview of pathogenesis of diabetes and within that the diabetic foot disease, um, I hope I've, I've highlighted that type 1 and type 2 diabetes are very different diseases, that there is overlap, but key differences are present that we need to take into account looking at research uh, and clinical uh, implications. And that looking at the model of understanding how Pathogenesis and type 2 diabetes and type 1 has really changed how we manage diabetes, but more importantly, it's changed patient outcomes. Um, I think using that model for diabetic foot disease is important. And I think we do realize, looking at all those pathways and arrows, that it is complex. The pathogenesis involved primarily with the interplay of vascular uh, disease and <coughs> neuropathy. Um, but we just need to take that into account and perhaps try, try to find some common pathways when we're looking at interventions. And moving forward, um, I think I've said this, but just that we need to have a mechanism-based uh, approach as we look at interventions for prevention and management. And we need to make sure that we have robust data. And yep. probably it's no surprise that whatever intervention we're going to have, which we're, we already do, is going to be more of a multimodal, multifactorial approach rather than a single agent or a single approach. And thank you very much. Thank you.